Good morning, and welcome to New Hope Baptist Church, where our mission is to glorify God and make disciples for Jesus Christ. Well, today I want to invite you downstairs as we have our potluck after the annual meeting. Well, I want to open up today with a story I read recently. And if you go back in time, during the time of Napoleon, in Great Britain, there's great angst and concern about this great battle called the Battle of Waterloo. And at the bottom of Waterloo, they, people at Great Britain were waiting anxiously to hear what was going to happen. And eventually they got news about what had happened at this battle. And the first part of the message said, Wellington defeated. And there was great suffering and anxiousness and Oh no, Napoleon is going to win. And they thought all was wrong. But at the moment of the time that they thought was the greatest defeat turned into the greatest victory because the rest of the message finally came in one word short and it said, Wellington defeats Napoleon. Na Wellington defeated Napoleon. And so that tears of sorrow and and suffering turned into a gladness and joy and the knowing, the triumph of Wellington over Napoleon. And that is true in life. Most of those greatest victories come about during the time of great sorrow. And, and, and as we'll look in the passage today, we will see this was true at the cross, at the cross on Calvary, all things look wrong, all things look defeated. It looked like Jesus had lost, the Messiah was dead, all things were rot. And yet, that was not the greatest defeat. Instead, three days later, we find out that was when victory was made. Victory was made at the cross at the point of greatest sorrow was actually the point of greatest victory. And as you look through the penetry of Scripture, you will see that um, Often it is during those moments of sorrow that victory happened. When Joseph was taken and imprisoned into Egypt, that was a moment of great victory because out of Joseph, he would not only save Egypt from the great famine that would hit them, but would save his own family from that same famine. Moses who would go out and go through many trials and tribulation and, and carrying this, this the, uh, uh, facing Pharaoh and going through the Red Sea and all the constant battles. It seemed like he was always in suffering, but those sufferings led to great victory as he led the Israelites into the promise land up to the gate up to the door and joshua would take them into battle with great suffering and difficulty but they would be victorious and elijah and ruth and habakkuk and so many more often god uses works through suffering to bring about great victory now Today, as we look at our series, we continue our series of Standing Firm in Grace. And today, as we look at 1 Peter, we're going to look at 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22. And in it, we'll look at how suffering leads to victory. Suffering to victory. How do those go from one into the other? And we'll look at three things. First, the victory at the cross, victory over hell, and victory at baptism. Victory at the cross, victory at he over hell, and victory over uh, victory of baptism. So look at verse 18 again, and it says this, For Christ also suffered for sin once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the Spirit. 
Now this verse starts with the word for, which reminds us that we are to take an account of the chapter, or the, the previous chapter that went over before, which talked about the suffering, how God used suffering to bring out righteousness, and that we will suffer in life, but we are to use it to be a good witness to the world. And, and Peter has said that it is better to suffer for the sake of righteousness and be a godly witness for the gospel. And in fact, Peter said, 1 Peter, 317 for it's better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing good rather than doing wrong people Peter has been helping us to see suffering from God's perspective and therefore he gives the ultimate perspective of suffering for God an example of Jesus Christ now there are three comforts as I read this first Verse 18, as you read about the sufferings of Christ and that he died for the, uh, the righteous, for the unrighteous, he says this, the first comfort I have is for that Jesus came to our sinful, fallen, broken world. He came down. We do not have a God as far and distance or remove. We have a God who came down into the Mount Kamara of our growing, broken world and came down to redeem us. We don't have a God that's different. We don't have a God that distance or unaware or unfeeling or uncaring. We have a very loving, caring, and compassionate God who came down. Number two, I find great comfort that he suffered for the sake of living a righteous life for God. In other words, when God is asking us to live for righteousness sake, even though we suffer and go through trials and tribulation, this is something that Jesus Christ himself did himself. In other words, God is not asking you to do anything that he hasn't already done himself. The third and most important comfort is that through his suffering on the cross, it made it right with God. It made us right before God. We have been justified. We have been sanctified. We have peace with God. It cost Jesus everything. He lived the perfect life that we could never live, and it died the life that we died the punishment for sin that we deserve so that we can be reconciled to the Father. Jesus was the righteous, and we are the unrighteous. We were enemies of God, and he was a perfect son of God, flawless lamb of God. And we we're enemies of God. He was the perfect son of God. It's only by the work of the son, by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, by the plan of the Father, that we cry out to the Father, Abba, Father. If we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, amen? Like Christ, we have been put uh, we have been put death in body. We have been raised in the spirit of new life with God the Father. And we have been renewed, restored, reconciled, and forever transformed by the grace, mercy, forgiveness, and uh, uh, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That was all made possible through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, suffering to victory. This is a salvation that Christ, Jesus Christ offers to all people. And Jesus died for the sinners, fallen, lost, broken, sinful, addicted. People feel burdened and broken down. Jesus died for you so you can be redeemed and restored to the Father. So the death will lead to victory. Let me say, if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that now is a day, now is the time to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And there is no better time because suffering leads to victory. Number two, victory over hell. He goes on to verse 19 and 20, and he says this, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who were once were disobedient with the patience of God, kept waiting in the days of Noah. During the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. 
Now let me say, as you look at this verse 19 and 20, it is probably one of the most confusing two verses in the Bible. It's something that a lot of scholars have argued with and debated over. In fact, as I was studying this particular scripture, I found five, let me say, five potential interpretation of this passage. And so if you struggle with it, if you're not certain that you are in good company, in fact, I will present you the five opinions, I will tell you the weaknesses of them all, and I will tell you where I land, but ultimately think about it, meditate, and make the decision for yourself. Now let's go on, and I will say that even Martin Luther himself, the reformer, also thought this was a beautiful passage, but had no idea what it was actually saying. Now, starting, for, uh, starting the first for you. The first for you is that Jesus was uh, metaphorically speaking to the people of Noah's time through Noah. That as Noah was preaching, it was as if Christ was preaching through Noah to the unsaved people of Noah's day. And that there was an offer of forgiveness, of salvation, to put their faith and trust in God until Noah closed the doors of the ark. And at that point was the last point. The only problem with this position is it seems to be talking about saying that when Jesus died, this event happened. Not that it happened in the past, not that Je Jesus had kind of spoke to Noah's generation, but that this is an event that happened after Jesus dies on the cross, this proclamation to these spirits happens then. So I think that's a problem with this position. Number two position is this. Second, Jesus is going down to hell to give all that did not hear the gospel an opportunity to hear the gospel for the first time to accept and give a second chance. So these are the saints, these are the unsaved people in hell, and Jesus goes down, and those who didn't get to hear the gospel, Jesus preaches the gospel, and some of them will be freed and go with him. The only problem with that is, is in Scripture it is made clear we are to die once and then face the judgment, which is in Hebrews 9.27. There's all throughout the scripture, you die and then you face the judgment. There is no second chance according to the scriptures. And so that's the problem with this view. The third view is Jesus is going down to the Old Testament saints that have been waiting in Sheol, or Abraham's bosom. Uh, in other words, these are the, the, the believers of the Old Testament who are the saints of the Old Testament, but have been waiting for the time of Christ, waiting for the time that they would go to be able to be at the Lord. And at the moment of Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus goes down, gets those Old Testament saints, and brings them up to heaven. The only problem with this particular interpretation of this verse, and it says, the spirits now in prison and who were once disobedient. Now, the problem with this is you would never call Old Testament saints as being those now in prison, as if they're being held against their will, nor would you consider the Old Testament saints as disobedient. I mean, just think of Abraham, Moses, David, this is not how you would describe them, and that's a problem with this interpretation. I'm very sympathetic towards this view, but I think there's a major flaw in it. Number four is this, for Jesus is going down to hell, where the spirits are being held captive, that is not describing humans, but is describing the fallen angels, demons that were around during the time of Noah. And in fact, in, if we look at the book of Genesis, it talks about these, uh, these, uh, the son of men going to the daughters of men and that they, they, uh, uh, they had physical relationships with them. And what most scholars, uh, what I think what's happening there is what you have is fallen angels are possessing human beings, and through human beings, these fallen angels are having physical relationships with women, and it is through these women, by possessing these men, they are able to 
create what are called the Nephilim. And it is that generation that becomes the most corrupted in the world, and God says the only thing we can do is wipe out all humanity. And so what Lot's car says is this is what he's talking about, these fallen angels that had taken advantage of human beings, and that they have been held in captive until this time. In fact, uh, Peter would mention again in Second Peter as well that this is an example of ultimate corruption. And so this is, and so Jesus is going to go down into hell to confront these fallen angels and proclaim, I have been victorious, I have defeated you, the thing that you're trying to prevent happened, I am victorious, I am the son of God, you lose. And so it's a, procla a proclaiming of victory. The only odd thing is the word proclaim here, Kia Russo, is normally about preaching. And when we think about preaching, we think about preaching the good news. And so some people have a problem with this particular viewpoint because if it's preaching, and usually preaching is about the good news, why that doesn't make sense in, in this interpretation. So that's the one flaw in this one. Uh, though I think it's a it's not a strong flaw, but it is a flaw. The fifth one is very similar to the last, the fourth one, which is instead of talking about um, fallen angels, he's talking about uh, sinful, wicked human beings that had rejected God, and he's still proclaiming his victory over sinful humanity, uh, but, and it just ends there. The only problem here is when we look at this passage, um, that the word, uh, 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 and, and the problem here again is it's proclaiming, not preaching, or it's, it's preaching and doesn't necessarily always proclaiming. So it has a similar link to number four. Um, the other thing is the word spirit uh, throughout, if it's all by itself, usually is referenced to angels or spiritual beings. And so these are the different views. So you have to decide for yourself what view you think is best. They all have flaws, none of them are perfect. However, I agree with most scholars. I think number four, I think these are fallen angels and Jesus is proclaiming victory over them. Now, I will say this. I think view three of gathering Old Testament saints, I think these two events happen the same thing. I think that this view is describing Jesus proclaiming victory over the demons, but at the same time, he gathers up the Old Testament saints and takes them up with them. I, I think these are simultaneous events, but that's that this particular is about proclaiming victory over demons. It actually works really well because the very next part is that Noah was suffering during this time and that the doors were closed, and though the doors were closed, it was victorious. The Lord would save eight people and brought safely through the waters. And it is the same for us today. For all that put their faith and trust in Jesus, Jesus has proclaimed victory over sin, Satan, hell, and death. We, he has proclaimed victory in all for those who are willing to enter the ark of Jesus Christ's salvation, will be saved, will be redeemed, will be restored, and she offers that. And so here we see God's victory over hell, and we too can have victory over sin, hell, and death if we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Christ, and that through suffering can lead to victory. Third and final point is a victory of baptism, victory of baptism. And in fact, uh, for Peter and some other uh, early church people, the, the times of Noah and, and the flood was a, a, um, often a Bible reference that was keyed with baptism. Another one would be the flood. That's another one that's been used for baptism, looking back to the Old Testament. But let's look at verse 21, and it first says this, corresponding to that baptism, now saves you. 
not to remove our dirt from flesh, but appeal of God, good conscience to God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting. This is another verse. Peter does have some hard verses to understand because we look at this verse. And, uh, and first of all, it talks about the word corresponding. So corresponding to what? What we just talk about? No, in this flood. That's what we're talking about. Uh, the word baptism, which you need to understand, is a word that means is baptismo, which means dip, submerge, die in a garment, taking on the qualities of thing that is submerged into. And so that's why as Baptists, we do not sprinkle, we do not pour, we baptize and dip for full immersion. That is what is modeled in the New Testament and is what the word baptismo means. Now, as you look at this verse, you, you'll quickly see something very odd about it. And it says this, baptism now saves you. And you say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. I'm confused. And, and, and Peter makes it even more confused because in his first sermon in Acts 2, 3, 8, he says this, repent each one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. And you say, wait a minute, what is baptism? I didn't think baptism saves you. I thought salvation was through faith alone, through grace alone, through Christ alone. I thought, I thought that's how salvation works. And it is how it works. In fact, if you look at Paul's writing in Acts 16.31, it says this, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Or John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that for whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so it's clear that salvation is by faith alone, through grace alone, through Christ alone. And so how do we correspond this verse to what Peter just said here? Well, we can look at a lot of different verses like Acts 19.5, Romans 6.4, 1 Corinthians 12.3. But I think Galatians 3.27 does a real good job of understanding what baptism means. In fact, if you have your Bible, you can open up to it, Galatians 3.27. And, and it's a good verse to, to underline because it says this. You were baptized into Christ, having clothed yourself with Christ. Is not the act of baptism that saves you, is what it represents. Baptism is a physical act that represents a spiritual reality that has already transpired. And if, if I could have a great example of it, it's like the, the wedding ceremony that you, you do before God, and between you and God, you're committing to God that you have accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. Not that it saves you. It has already happened. But it is a point at which you say, yes, and it's a confirmation of that saving faith. That is, baptism does not save you, but represents the salvation that you have through Jesus Christ. Now, Peter makes it clear, not washing uh, that is important, an appeal of good conscience. So it's not washing of dirt off. So it's not about washing dirt off. If that was, if it did say that, then it might have saying that you can say it has some salvation prayer. But what it is, is he says what? It's about appeal of good conscience. An appeal of good conscience. In fact, it's a, it's a declaration of your promise. It is where you sign the contract. Make the handshake. It is a promise that you will go and serve Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you accepted his salvation. It is a final signing of the contract like I did on a house a few days ago. And so it is a sign, a promise, a pledge, an obligation to say, I will follow Christ. Find that in the end, as Paul explains in Romans 6, 4, therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death. So as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We suffer by dying to our old self. 
but we are victorious as we walk in a newness of life through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of the victory is a resurrection of Jesus Christ that proves that it has happened. It proves that the victory has been won. It proves that we're now dead to sin, alive to Christ, and will never be the same again. But not only that, but in verse 22 it says this, Who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers have been subject to him? Jesus was resurrected and went to the far, proving his victorious. But not only is he victorious, but it describes how he has victory. He has a power, he has a victory and authority over all angels, all authorities, all powers, and subject. So all the universe, angels, human, government, everything has been laid underneath Jesus' feet. He has now been victorious. And if you are in Christ, you too are victorious because Jesus Christ has saved you and redeemed you if you put your faith in him. It's through his victory on the cross, it's through what he has done that you are saved. Beloved, some of you might... Um, might mean it's time for you to get baptized. If any of you have not put your faith, have not done the final step of like getting baptized, it was one of the things we're command was to be baptized. In fact, Jesus tells the disciple, go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you have not gone baptism, there's not too late. You can be baptized today. You can get baptized. We'll start seeing me after church. We'll get to talking. We'll see about uh, where you would be interested in getting baptized. But it's one of the things we're commanded to do. It's a public declaration of what we have done. Beloved, there are many of us going through suffering and hard times today due to persecution, sin, sickness, and death. And let me reassure you this, that in the future, all things will be set right, and you'll receive the victory in Christ if you put your faith and trust in Him. And all you have to say is, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That's all it is to it. It's a simple thing, a simple act. Repent and believe the gospel. I want to end today with a short story that I read titled Victory Through the Blood of the Lamb by Christian Victory. It says this, Dr. Sewell, an old Methodist from dying, shut out loud, praise of God. And his friend would say, Dr. Sewell, do not exert yourself. Whisper, doctor, whisper. And he answers, let angels whisper, said he. But the soul cleansed from sin by the blood of Christ, a soul redeemed from the death and hell, just as on the threshold of eternity glory. Oh, if I had a voice that would reach from the pole to pole, I would proclaim to all the world, victory, victory through the blood of the Lamb. Perhaps we, the saints who are still alive, will ought to shout the glorious gospel more. Some final thoughts. First, may we live more fully in the light of the suffering and victory of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We say that again. May we live in more fully in the light of the suffering of victory of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's because what he suffered, it's because what he bled, it's because what he died, that we have victory. We have victory in Jesus Christ. Never forget that. And four things for you to consider. One, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Please, I encourage you, I plead with you, if you do not know Jesus Christ Savior, today is a day. Number two, treat Jesus as a sovereign Lord of Lord and King of Kings over your life, that there's no area of life that you should not get over to him because he's faithful, he has died for you, he has redeemed you, and he's worthy of all of honor and praise. We should fully surrender to our sovereign. Number three, please, 
Get baptized. Get baptized. Follow God's command to repent and be baptized. And number four, seek him in prayer. He is our sovereign. He is Lord. He has been victorious. He is the one person we can trust to go to our prayers. He is listening. He is paying attention. I see, I implore you, if you to pray to Jesus every day. And every day, you can have victory in Jesus Christ. Not to say you're going to have a perfect life. Not to say that life is going to be easy. By no means. But through Christ, you will have victory in your life. That he has redeemed you, restored you. And he will walk with you. He will listen to you. He came down for you. He will listen to you. He died for you. He will save you. He was raised up so you can be raised up. Seek the Lord in prayer. Let me finish off with a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. If you like the videos, please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. God bless you, and have a good day. When